Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to all of our LSE students. Welcome members of the public and others who have joined us to the LSE. I'm Craig Calhoun, the director of the LSE, and it is a pleasure to welcome Martin Revalian back to the school. Martin completed his PhD in the economics department and then taught here at the LSE, at Oxford, and at the Australian National University. He joined the World Bank in 1988, rising to become director of the bank's research department and acting chief economist and senior vice president. During his time at the bank, Martin has continued to research and publish extensively in the areas of poverty and poverty reduction policies. He has written three books and over 200 scholarly articles on the topic, and he has deeply informed policy through his research. The title of tonight's lecture is More Relatively Poor People in a Less Absolutely Poor World. Martin will argue that the true nature of global poverty is disguised by measurement techniques that focus on absolute as opposed to relative deprivation. He will suggest new approaches that take account of the negative social impact of relative inequality and will describe some of their implications for how we think about global development policy. Martin will speak for around 35 minutes, after which there will be time for questions. For those of you on Twitter, the suggested hashtag for this evening's event is hash LSE poverty. Please welcome Martin Revalian. Well, I'm, I'm glad uh, you mentioned Twitter because in some sense this is also, also a Twitter title. It's the, it summarizes the entire talk in just the title. Um, but let me go, go and explain a bit better. Um, the two sort of common uh, statements about poverty. Um, this is a motto of the World Bank. As you work in, walk into the lobby of the building in huge letters right in front of you is the following claim. Our dream is a world free of poverty. Um, I'm not a big follower of things in the Bible, I'll readily admit, but um, a biblical quote that one often hears, the poor you will always have with you. Um, trying to understand and reconcile these two, these two claims is really what this talk is about, and, and also the implications of development policy. Um, I'm going to start with a discussion of alternative approaches to measuring poverty. Uh, I'm going to try and open that out in a way that um, uh, hasn't been done before, um, in a way that takes uh, the concept of relative poverty more seriously than I think has been taken before, and more appropriately to a development context. And that's really about taking social effects on welfare seriously in global poverty measurement. I'm then going to present new measures of both absolute poverty and relative poverty, and I'm going to talk a bit about the implications for development policy and the way we think about development policy. Alternative approaches, what do we mean by poverty? There are really two definitions out there in two worlds that although there's been a lot of convergence of ideas and of course convergence of average uh, incomes across the world, the rich and poor worlds, there are still these two very different definitions of poverty. Absolute poverty prevails in the developing world defined in terms of poverty lines that have claimed to have a fixed real value over, over people, and over places and over time. Uh, and that's been an orthodoxy and um, typically anchored to nut nutritional requirements and so on. But also recognizing that there are, even taking nutritional requirements as the anchor, there are infinitely many commodity bundles that can achieve the same nutritional intake. So there's automatically a scope, if you like, for some kind of relativism to creep in, relativism across countries, across settings, in this very idea of, of absolute poverty. And the question is then poor by whose standards? And since um, I've got a little bit too, too many slides here, I'm going to skip some. This is my, one of my favorite pictures. Um, on the vertical axis here, you have national poverty lines across countries, and as best that we can determine. We've gone to, not gone physically to say all these countries, we've gone to the uh, official documents or the poverty work that's done in that country, tried to figure out what the, the national poverty line is, and we've converted it to purchasing power parity at 2005 prices. Um, the, the highest poverty line we found anywhere in the world was in Luxembourg, a poverty line of $43 a day. At roughly the same average income, the United States has a poverty line of $13 a day. Uh, very 
very similar average income, very dissimilar poverty lines. But the interesting thing about this picture is the, the gradient you see there. Poverty lines, not too surprisingly, tend to be higher in richer countries. Luxembourg and, and, and the United States are a bit unusual in the variance at the top end there, but you've clearly got a relativist gradient, what I'm going to call a relativist gradient in poverty lines. When we think about national poverty lines, when we think about global poverty measurement, we've taken as a starting point the average poverty line of the poorest countries. So essentially we focus on the bottom of this picture, and that gives $1.25 a day. That is, with you know, considerable precision, the the average poverty line of the poorest, well, acceptable precision, I wouldn't want to exaggerate, but the average poverty line of the poorest 20 or 30 countries. Um, and, you know, there are all kinds of other ways you can make that calculation. I actually got to the $1.25 a day by, by eyeballing this picture. Right? It's a, a very sophisticated method. You look at the picture long enough. And in fact, the, the, the schedule of poverty lines I'm going to show you, I also got, got there by eyeballing the picture long enough. But given that I'm a researcher, I also did some fancy econometrics with threshold mo models estimated on piecewise linear regressions and all this stuff, and it came back to about 25 a day. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to bore you with all of that. Um, that's where a deliberately conservative definition. It only claims to be what it is. It claims to be a, a poverty line that's anchored to the living standards, uh, the, the idea of what poverty means in the world's poorest countries. Nothing more than that. We've never claimed it's the only poverty line you should think about. In a sense, what we've claimed is it wouldn't be reasonable to say to use a lower poverty line than this. If we find, as we do, that roughly a bit over one billion people live below uh, this poverty line, it wouldn't be reasonable to say the number of poor in the world is, 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 is much less than that if we're judging poverty by the average poverty line of the poorest countries. But, but it uh, by no means uh, avoid, uh, precludes the possibility of using higher poverty lines in richer countries. That's never been... Uh, uh, disputed. The second definition in the rich world is, is a relative poverty definition. And it's, it's very common in Western Europe, um, the OECD. Uh, it says that poverty, the poverty line should be directly proportional to the mean of the country. The poverty line is there, there's just some constant proportion, typically around a half of the poverty line in that country. Um, that's what I'm going to call a strongly relative poverty line, and I'm going to make, argue that it makes very little sense. And it's very inappropriate for talking about poverty in poor countries. But with a tweaking of that idea, changing it just a little bit, it can make a lot of sense. Um, if we go into the literature on, on relative poverty, we see two definitions, two ways of thinking about relative poverty. What I call a welfareist justification. It's welfareist because it goes back to the idea of individual welfare, but it, instead of thinking of individual welfare, think of, think of your valuation of your welfare as depending only on your own consumption, which is the way we model it in economics typically. We think it also depends on something to do with your relative position, your consumption relative to some group of people around you. And if we think of that group of people as for the purposes of global poverty measurement, it's natural to think of that group of people as the, the country you live in. Could be all kinds of aggregation problems in getting to that formulation, but let's put them aside for the purpose of the argument. Let's say it's, it's a welfare justification that rests on the assumption utility depends on own consumption, and it depends on relative consumption, relative to the country you live in. And the secondly, that we want the utility, the poverty line, to be a money metric of utility. We want it to be a welfare consistent poverty line. That second criterion is, is not uh, particularly controversial amongst economists. We've anchored poverty lines to welfare forever. We, we do it, uh, we've always thought of the poverty line as the money metric of utility. The non-welfareist argument is, is quite different. It points to the cost of social inclusion. It points to expenditures you need to make in richer countries that you don't need to make in poorer countries to be socially included. And it says that social inclusion is one important capability for anchoring a poverty line. Um, you can vary these things in different ways. Here's a simple formulation of the welfareist argument. Utility is a function of own consumption, C. Uh, so your valuation of utility is dependent not on just on your own consumption, but also on relative consumption, as I described. The poverty line is a money metric of utility. So we simply fix that utility level and back out the poverty line appropriate. Clearly, that's going to be an increasing function of, of the mean. But is it going to be directly proportional to the mean? In general, no. What is the condition under which this argument, 
the, the, the classic argument about comparison effects, social effects, relative deprivation, it's called different things in different literatures between economics, sociology, anthropology, it's called different things, but it's the same concept. What does it mean, what would it require to get a poverty line that's directly proportional to the mean? The answer is obvious. Your utility does not just depends on your relative consumption, it only depends on your relative consumption. The only way this formulation can give the strongly relative poverty lines that we've seen for all these years is that utility depends on only on relative consumption. I have to, I have to close off that the only way. And that's hardly plausible. I don't think anybody argues that. Maybe in the richest imaginable society, you only care about your relative position. But if we're going to take this to the world as a whole, we're certainly <laughs> not happy to start with the richest possible society. We're going to be taking this to the poor societies where I firmly believe social comparison is important, but I don't believe this is any reasonable way of, of thinking about it. Um, the the non-welfarist non arguments are all around capabilities. In some formulation, and Amartya Sen has been very important in this literature and has, has certainly influenced me enormously. Um, and we have various formulations of that, uh, Atkinson and Bourguignon, for example, and the idea of combining both basic survival needs and social needs. Um, the problem with all of that is essentially around this. If we think of the rationales, what are the rationales for, for a, a capability-based approach to a poverty line? It essentially says that there's some kind of social inclusion need there's something that, you, you, that is important in your society for you to participate in that society. And the famous example of that is in The Wealth of Nations, where Adam Smith talked about the role of a linen shirt. And he said, a, credibly, uh, a credible la um, day laborer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt, the want of which would be supposed to denote that disgraceful degree of poverty, which it is presumed nobody can well fall into without extreme bad conduct. I love this expression, extreme bad conduct, and it was how Adam, what Adam Smith means there is, is poverty. Um, and with him, similarly, anthropologists have taught us a lot about this, and we've learned about the importance of celebrations. We've learned about the social role of clothing in, in, in even in very poor societies. And, we've, and the, one of my favorite examples is, is Kat in Yemen. I, I work in Yemen a bit, and um, if anybody's been to Yemen, or you'll see it in also in Djibouti, um, uh, the great gobs of stuff that people are chewing, that's cat. It's a, a leaf. It's a, um, not a serious drug. It's really a, a mild stimulant, a bit like coffee. And uh, I tried it once. It didn't do much for me. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, you chew this stuff. And to understand cat in Yemen, poor people are spending like 10% of their income on cat. You know, how do you understand this? You have to understand it as a social inclusion need. And you have to understand that cat sessions in Yemeni society are hugely important to participation in that society. And, you know, there are all kinds of examples in this society everywhere of those sorts of things. CAT is actually a social inclusion need, and it's a basic, arguably, a basic human need in this society. Um, I've had lots of arguments with um, Yemenis about this, and, you know, so I'm not claiming it's conclusive, but including a, a big argument with the director of the statistics office in Yemen who was really pissed off about these cat sessions because his staff were spending hours in these sessions and, and they should have been working for him. And given my observations of the productivity of the statistics department, I was sort of sympathetic. <laughs> but there, there may be all kinds of tensions and product trade-offs here between social inclusion and productivity and, of course, all kinds of issues like that. But the key point is that the social role <coughs> of consumption does not imply strongly relative poverty lines. Why? Because the price of cat the, the, the cost of cat cannot go to zero. The cost of that linen shirt cannot go to zero. If you say that the social inclusion need is directly proportional to, to mean consumption or mean income, what you're saying is in the limit as mean consumption goes to zero, the cost of social inclusion goes to zero. How can that be? The cost of that linen shirt is just the same for the, in the poorest imaginable society as in the richest society. It's just not, not believable. The cost, there has to be a positive lower bound to the cost of social inclusion. So if you're going to take this idea of relative poverty to poor societies, you can't have this formulation. It doesn't make sense to have a, an, uh, something that has no uh, positive lower bound. It cannot have that limiting property. You've got to tweak it. You've got to change the formulation. And here's how, very simple. The blue line here is a strongly relative line. 
Again, poverty line on the vertical axis, mean on the horizontal axis, and it's directly, poverty line is directly proportional to the mean. I'm going to tweak it in two ways. One, I'm going to introduce a positive intercept. You can think of that intercept as the, 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 the cost of the linen shirt. And it has to be bounded below. There has to be a minimum to that that's positive. Yeah? And then I'm going to ask, well, who in the world is both neither absolutely poor nor relatively poor? And I'm going to use that as the unifying concept here for measuring poverty. Now, it's very important. This is what I call the elephant in the room. Step back a bit. Why do we see this, this picture? I showed you this already, remember, with Luxembourg and the United States. And why do we see this picture? Well, there are really two reasons. And the problem is that we will, I don't think, ever know which is the right reason. I told you, I've talked so far about the social inclusion arguments, the relativist arguments as to why we see that picture. They, they come down to something like saying that utility is a function of own consumption and relative consumption. But there's another argument, which is the reference utility level itself is income dependent. If we think of that formulation and try to back out a poverty line, it could be it be a function of the mean, but could, the mean could enter in two ways. There are two parameters that could be a function of the mean. The utility function itself can vary with the mean, but the reference utility level might also vary with the mean. I don't have a theory of how that, I don't believe there is an existing theory of social norms, but there's a concept of a social norm, and that may itself may vary with average income. So there's a deep identification problem here. And I don't think, I actually don't think we'll ever solve it. Which says, what does it imply? It says that maybe the, the absolute line is the lower bound, where social inclusion effects and social effects are ruled out. Utility depends only on own consumption, and we only use one reference utility level for judging poverty. And maybe the relative poverty line is actually the upper bound to a true utility consistent poverty line. The upper bound when the social effect is entirely through utility. It's entirely through comparison effects in the built into the utility function. Um, I, I very much like Robert Frank's uh, interpretation of that social effect. And he talks a lot about this in various papers and a nice book and published a few years ago and, um, uh, about inequality in the United States. And, um, and it's very much about social comparison effects in utility. But there's also, there, are so, there could be income effects on social norms. And as scientists, we have to recognize that we can't identify the two. We cannot distinguish them. I don't actually know. I've been thinking for a while, but I, I don't know how we ever will. will. And maybe there'll be some cute experiment we'll come up with at some time that will separate them, but we don't know yet. So there's a huge uncertainty in global poverty measurement about the extent of social effects. It's not just about the extent of social effects, but where they are. Where, are those income effects in the social norms we use in assessing whether some person is poor or not? Are they in the welfare space, or are they in, in the utility function itself? And that's what we don't know. Um, the bounds then, I'm going to propose that the, if we agree that poverty is, is ultimately, um, has to be welfare consistent, we judge people by the common level of welfare, but we allow for the possibility of social effects on welfare, then the only thing we can, the only legitimate thing we can do is establish the bounds on the true poverty measure. The absolute measure must be the lower bound, and the relative, what I'm going to call the weekly relative poverty measure, is the upper bound. What do the numbers look like? Um, I, I, there's a couple of slides I'm going to slip a, skip about how we measure poverty, the data sets we use, the 900 household surveys we use, the huge amount of... One thing I'll tell you is we, I haven't used anybody's estimate of anything in this paper. Every single number has been calculated by me or my assistant from the micro data. It's not that we don't trust other people's calculations of things. It's just that we don't trust other people's <laughs> calculations of things. I don't know how to... You know, we, we just don't know. So everything's, everything's calculated afresh, um, and we, we, we have smart ways of doing that, and, and we try to do it well. But you're going to have to accept it. You're going to have to trust me. Um, <laughs> we're currently working with a sample of 2 million households um, globally. Um, well, actually, we've just introduced high-income countries, but now I'm, I'm just talking about a developing world. Uh, many data challenges are low, uh, remain, lags and uneven coverage, comparability problems. We could talk forever about every one of these problems, underreporting in surveys, selective compliance problems. I'm going to skip over all of that. We can talk about them in question time if you wish. What do we see? Progress for the poorest in the aggregate. These, this picture gives you 
uh, the dollar twenty-five a day line. I also give you two dollars a day. Um, clear progress in terms of a dollar twenty-five a day. That's the blue line there. We've seen a, a halving of the absolute poverty rate over this uh, period from 1981 to 2010. We now have all the 2010 numbers. It just follows pretty much linearly uh, the, the picture here. Um, the $2 a day rate also. You, a lot of this is due to China, but not entirely due to China. We still get a, a declining poverty measures with poverty rates when we take out China. Um, I can use higher order poverty measures, poverty gap indices, and so on. Uh, it doesn't really fundamentally change the story. Um, Millennium Development Goal 1, uh, you, as you may or may not know, was to halve the 1990 extreme poverty rate by 2015. We figure that we achieved that in 2010, five years ahead of the of the target date and despite the global financial crisis. And I'm now very confident of that. Uh, the actually, the developing world, the poor in the developing world sort of went through the crisis. Obviously, some peop many people were hurt, there's no question. But the overall results are it's, it's a small blip. Um, a crisis now would be a very different story because obviously the developing world was very well prepared, could sound good economic policies in many countries, a uh, fantastic injection of some 500 billion by the Chinese in a very short space of time. A whole lot of great conditions that I'm not sure would be, um, I'm pretty sure would not be the case now. But, so that I, I'm, I'm making that, a, I'm, I'm putting important qualification on that. A robust to the poverty line, yes, it doesn't matter terribly where I draw the poverty line in terms of the qualitative conclusion that absolute poverty has fallen. Uh, I give you a bunch of the community distribution functions here and I'm not gonna go into that. Um, less progress in getting over $2 a day. Essentially what's happened, we've got, um, you know, we've got significant progress in getting people over that $1.25 a day number. More stickiness if we look between a dollar, uh, between, um, it's the, the lower one there is a dollar a day, between a dollar and dollar twenty-five a day, a relatively constant proportion, and actually rising numbers of people in that interval between a uh, dollar twenty-five and two dollars a day. So there's been this bunching up in the global distribution just above this poverty line, and, and clearly that's uh, very important also in the context of of thinking about a, a crisis going forward. Uh, an uneven progress across regions, that's, that's very clear. Um, South Asia, we've seen falling poverty numbers recently. Actually, all regions we've seen falling poverty numbers since about 2000. There's been a clear structural break. I, 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 I'm not sure I have details, uh, get time to go through it, but one of the striking things is there were, for some, around 2000, there was really a structural break in, in the dynamics of poverty in the world. We went onto a whole new trajectory and not just China, it's really a big role played by Sub-Saharan Africa, which is really very encouraging. Um, here's the just showing that in the picture. Uh, prior to about 2000, the, the uh, trend rate of, uh, of poverty reduction was 0.4 percentage points per year. It's now one percentage points per year, point per year. I think we've got enough observations to be reasonably confident that that is a break in the trend. You do the standard test on the, on the first structural break, it's got a T ratio of like 10. It's, 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 it's something seemed to have happened. And I very, very, I really resisted putting that box in, MemDGs, because it is remarkable that 2000 is the date of the Millennium Summit. It's the date when the MDGs were ratified, when the, the world basically said we will strive to achieve this goal, uh, a whole set of goals, including um, the poverty rate. Um, but, you know, that's, that's really heroic indeed. There are all kinds of things that we'd have to worry about in making that statement. So big question mark on that observation, but clear on the difference in trends. Regions, we've seen progress in East Asia, South Asia, Africa, uh, all since that period, a much more uneven progress. Of course, East Asia has been uneven, but a tremendous downward reduction in poverty over this period. Uh, the upper bound. Here's the, the calibration I'm using for the relative poverty measures. Um, this fits really well. Um, I, again, I, I really got to these parameters by just staring at that picture for long enough. Um, maybe other people would have seen it quicker, but I got it after a while. A slope of one over two and uh, a, a social minimum cost of social inclusion, a dollar twenty half of a dollar twenty five a day. If I estimate a, a Hansen threshold model, I get really nails it almost exactly. Uh, the slope is 0.47 and a T ratio of about fifteen. You know, it's a dollar twenty-five, a dollar twenty-three, using the Hansen estimator, and very precisely estimated, sixty-two cents of that lower bound. So eyeballing worked pretty well. These are the average lines. They're not used analytically. It's just to give you an idea in dollars a day. 
The average line has risen from about $2 a day to $3 a day over the period. This is this average weekly relative poverty line that I've talked about. And it's varying between regions, and, and we don't, in all honesty, know how much of that variation is differences in the cost of achieving the same level of welfare versus dis income effects on the social norms. Hence, it's an upper bound. It's an upper bound if all of the difference is social effects on welfare, none of it is, social effect, is income effects on social norms. Under that assumption, we can put together the lower and upper bounds. So now we have a, a, a new, new way of thinking about the global poverty measures where we have a lower bound, the absolute poverty line, an upper bound, an absolute plus relative, if you like, this is then between the two, the, the uh, relative poverty rate. It's not precise, actually. You have to think a bit, I mean, what I just said is, it needs a bit of qualification, but let's put that aside. We can think of the total poverty as containing an absolute segment and a relative segment. Um, the rising numbers are relatively poor, hence the second half of the title. Um, rising numbers of people who are, to be precise, relatively poor, but not absolutely poor, with falling numbers are absolutely poor. Uh, by region, uh, the picture is, is like this. We're seeing um, of the 47% uh, in 2008, I, I, I should have updated this to 2010, um, just the last few days we've done the numbers, but 47% um, for, for um, living in, uh, uh, totally poor, if you like, relative and absolute, that are who, uh, who are, are either absolutely poor or relatively poor, of which 22% uh, are absolutely poor, and there you see the differences across regions. Expected trajectories going forward for the lower bound, we're going to see, a, just following a, a, a linear projection of this, we're going to be seeing a decline to about 9% within 10 years. The upper bound is going to stabilize in terms of the numbers of poor, we're projecting forward to about, ex in other words, that increase in the number of relatively poor we think has topped out, and it's going to stabilize at about 2.7 billion, absolute and relative, over time. Implications, very quickly, I've got a five minutes or so, implications for analyzing progress against poverty. And here I think we want to um, first take a, a stock taking of what do we know. So I'm going to try and give you in a, for five minutes a summary of of everything we know about the importance of growth and redistribution in developing countries. First, we know, and we've, we've been more and more confident about this as the years go by, that economic growth is typically good for absolute poverty reduction. I emphasize typically, but just meaning that's a regression line, it's got a negatively slo negative slope, and uh, here it's a regression of the proportionate change in the poverty measure, absolute poverty, against the proportionate change in the survey mean. And, um, the, on, on average, growth is distribution neutral. The way you can see that in the picture is by studying that picture. Look at the, the rate of poverty reduction at zero rate of growth. Here I've used the rate of growth in the survey mean. Uh, that doesn't matter terribly much, although the, the slope tends to be lower if you use the national accounts, given the uh, attenuation errors that, all, that arise from doing that. Um, attenuation bias. If you just look at the, uh, the rate, ask yourself what the rate of poverty reduction is at zero rate of growth, no change, zero growth, no change in the mean, then it's zero. In other words, there's no distributional effect on average. Inequality, <coughs> is uh, growth is inequality neutral on average. Half the time inequality is increasing in developing countries, half the time it's decreasing in growing developing countries, contracting as well. Um, initial inequality we've also learned is hugely important to the impact of growth on poverty. So yes, growth is good for poverty reduction, but how good is it? Well, it's really, really good in low inequality countries, and it's just okay in high inequality countries. And that's basically right. If you talk to a country like Brazil or South Africa, you're getting an elasticity of, of the poverty of poverty to growth, which is really quite quite low. You know, Brazil has done it by redistribution and, and economic changes that were redistributive. But in terms of the growth, direct growth impact, um, much lower impact in high inequality countries. You go to a low inequality country, huge Im differences in impact. Um, what's happening to inequality in the world? Again, this is just a little background because I now want to make a few comments about how all these stylized facts are influenced by uh, taking this relative poverty perspective. We're seeing, um, we've seen fall and falling total inequality in the developing world um, over time, but some sign that it's increased since 2005. Uh, the pattern of total inequality is driven by the between-country component of inequality. These are all 
it's more or less accepted stylized facts. I've given some more recent numbers here that you may not have seen. And the reason for that interest in the recent numbers is there's really been a, a change since about 2005. And um, it's quite um, striking. And it, if you go you know, under the numbers to figure out what's happening, a uh, big part of the story is China. Growth in China until maybe 2005, growth in China was inequality decreasing globally. Right? China was a poor country. Despite that increase, huge increase in inequality in China, the growth in China, a low-income country, was obviously reducing global inequality. But China's now got to a point where China's growth is going to increase inequality within the developing world. We've reached a turning point. Um, okay, um, we've also learnt that inequality impedes poverty reduction and economic growth. I think the evidence on this is now really overwhelming. And, um, and there's a lot of debates and a lot of issues about this, and we can talk about the details. But uh, on, the, on the science of it, I'm really convinced that now on this point, that inequality is bad for economic growth and poverty reduction. Um, we've also learned that poverty itself is bad for poverty reduction and bad for economic growth. Um, this is a, a sort of new story. Um, I have a recent paper on this, and, um, and you can read more about it. But, but, but essentially what, what I've, I've come to learn is that, is that um, one of the big constraints on both growth and future poverty reduction is high levels of poverty. And the most likely explanation for that, I can't prove it, but the most likely explanation in my view is the nature of credit market constraints. In countries with uh, imperfect credit okay. markets, it tends to be the poor who are locked out of access to credit. That means in very poor societies there are more people who can't invest in stuff that would be good for growth, and hence the late rate of growth is, is lower. So if impl implications, well one of them is that this growth story and growth and poverty story is going to be changed. But here we have to notice something. I didn't, I didn't point it out, but now's a good time. Um, when I said that we need to introduce that positive lower bound to the cost of social inclusion, that turns out to be almost identical to saying that if you allow for a positive lower bound on social inclusion, economic growth will be relatively relative relative poverty reducing. Now, if you don't allow for that, if you go for a poverty line that's directly proportional to the mean, then clearly, in, if inequality remains the same, all, in, all incomes growing at the same rate, then poverty can't change. The poverty rate must remain the same. Right? Obviously, all, all, all incomes grow at the same rate, the poverty line grows at the same rate too, yeah? and the thing is, is automatically homogeneous degree zero, the, 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 nothing will change. Yeah? Once you introduce that positive lower bound to the cost of social inclusion, the elasticity of the poverty line to the mean cannot ever reach one. So it cannot be that the poverty line rises by the same proportion. So it must be that poverty will fall with economic growth. So it actually makes, in some sense, growth is going to be better for poverty reduction if you switch from strongly relative to weakly relative. But if you compare weakly relative concepts with absolute concepts, the story is very different. Just to show that, it's sort of intuitively obvious, because now the, the poverty line is going to be varying with the mean. It won't be directly proportional to the mean, but it'll be increasing <coughs> with the mean. And it's going to put a break on the extent of which poverty, growth is going to re reduce poverty. And that just this picture just shows you the extent of that break. Uh, the red line is the, the, the my weekly relative poverty measure. It's falling with economic growth. These are um, uh, region date specific uh, data points. Um, and the absolute line is falling much more sharply. The absolute poverty uh, measures are falling more sharply with growth. It's also going to mean, if, it's, if, if, it, if it gets wheels, if it gets traction, we're going to start to see that it's going to switch the discussion more towards inequality, the poverty discussion. Why? Because, well, I've already showed us uh, that growth, uh, the, 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 although the weekly relative poverty measures will respond to economic growth, they won't respond as much as the absolute poverty measures, and they're going to be more responsive to inequality than the absolute poverty measures. Uh, you can figure that out and uh, just do your marginal rates of substitution to figure out what the, how the marginal rate of substitution changes when you switch from the absolute to the relative, holding everything constant initially. The bottom line is that basically two-thirds of the acceptable increase in inequality when fighting absolute poverty will, we, will, will no longer be acceptable if you switch to a relative poverty concept. So that's just giving you an idea of how the marginal rate of substitution, how the relative weight on inequality versus growth is going to shift in this discussion. 
Okay, conclusions. Well, I, I, I'm just summarizing now. We've seen falling absolute poverty. Uh, socioeconomic data from the developing world are improving, and we're getting, uh, but there's still a lot to do here, but we're, we're getting more and more confident of the picture over time. And of course, less and less confidence go back in time. So, you know, in the sense if I had nicely worked out standard errors everywhere here, the further back in time, we're less confident. Um, the dull 25 a day poverty line has, has um, um, assesses poverty by the standards of the poorest countries, and we've seen progress there, and uh, we think that the MDG1 has already been achieved. But we're also seeing rising relative poverty, and essentially it's the other side of the coin to that success against absolute poverty. A big chunk, in fact it's close to 80% of that increase in the number of relatively poor, in the title of this talk, that increase is coming from the reduction in the number of absolutely poor. So it's important to realize that. It's not like this is some terrible bad news I'm giving you that there's this rising relative poverty and it's really, it's, 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 a, it's the other side of the coin essentially. But obviously people rising above $1.25 a day, they're not suddenly catapulted to above $10 a day. They're, they're, as I showed you, they're getting bunched up in that lower, lower region. In the region from about $1.25 to $2.50 a day is very dense now. Um, so essentially slower progress against absolute poverty can be seen as the other side of the coin to our success against absolute poverty. Implications of development policies going forward. I think the absolute versus relative, I think we kind of need to lay that debate to rest a little bit. Um, I don't think, certainly I don't think policymakers should be framing the problem as, as, as a choice between the two. As I've argued, I think if we are going to be welfare consistent about poverty measurement, which has been a principle, whether welfare is taught about in capabilities or utility, whatever, it's been a, a core principle of the way we think about poverty <coughs> forever. Um, then we're going to have to think of it differently. It's not absolute versus relative, it's a lower bound versus an upper bound on the welfare consistent poverty measure. So I think even the words, the, the labeling will have to change. We'll need both measures to get a complete picture. On growth versus redistribution, so you know, I'm just really, I guess, two big development policy debates, absolute versus relative, so you've heard me on that. Growth versus redistribution, I think this will really switch if it, if it is uh, accepted. We, we're gonna switch attention more have to switch attention more towards um, inequality in thinking about how that upper bound will change. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Thanks very much, Martin, and thanks for being willing to take some questions at this yeah. point. Interesting talk, and there should be questions. Do you want to take them from the podium or down here? What's, what's your pleasure? And I'll do you want to call on people or shall I? You call on people. I'll call on people. Does anyone have a question and a willingness to go first? Okay, at the end of the front row. Um, Judith Shapiro, LSE. Um, I have a problem with some distance from all these countries in trying to get a hard-headed sense of the two. And I wonder if there are any other measures like child mortality, infant mortality, mm -hmm things that do follow the Sen idea you said you were influenced by, mm -hmm. um, education, access to mobile telephones, mm -hmm. whatever it is that could be used to try to give people like me a sense of what we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they end up being reduced to your numbers, and I do trust your numbers, but there's still numbers in the end, and, and only those little boxes you do with vignettes will tell me anything, and they're not for a hard-headed person who wants to see some econometrics too. So I wondered if you have any thoughts on that or if the research group is, is thinking about that. Okay. Oh, we can collect. Do you want to collect a few? I think collect is probably right. more efficient. In the, back in the red scarf right there, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I'm Heider from uh, Bain & Company. Um, I was wondering what this very interesting concept means when we look at progress over a much longer time scale. Um, so, um, for example, when we look over a couple of centuries, what would... <laughs> I, I saw you were looking from where I was sitting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was wondering what, what this I means... Know how she knew. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was wondering what it means when we look over centuries. So I assume that the current time is, is the time where absolute poverty is at the lowest point when we compare it over five, 500 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years. Do you think the same is true for relative poverty? 
Or do you think there are periods in history where relative poverty would have been less pronounced than in the current uh, time? Thank you very much. So let's take one more, and then I'll let you do three. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, Robert Wade, um, LSC. Um, all your numbers depend on um, the calculation of purchasing power parity. Um, these numbers, or at least many of them, come from the International Comparison Program, which, at least in the late 90s, early 2000s, was on the point of institutional collapse and very badly resourced, for example, so that there was a long delay in the release of um, the numbers. What I'm wondering about is um, what is the current state of that project as a, as a place for calculating reliable numbers? I take it from the fact that you didn't mention anything about it, that you think you're p quite prepared to take the purchasing power numbers at face value and then base all your calculations on them. Okay. Um, Judith Shapiro. Um, I'm actually not sure you mean other indicators as supplementary or as ways of, of validation? Validation. validation. Um, <laughs> oh, you want both? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the valid, well, the supplementary indicators, uh, the way I reason this, and I think this is probably, I know, I think, a reasonable consensus around this, at least at the World Bank, but. Um, is that we, we always look for supplementary indicators to leave to capture the things that are missing from our our, our numbers. Now these are house these are based on um, you know generally pretty decent you know I'm not going to exaggerate but consumption aggregates that, but they're aggregates of market goods. So one of the things and they're aggregates for the household. So two things missing: non-market goods and inequality within the household. So we look for indicators to pick those things up. And I actually, I'm very fond of using child mortality rates because they're, I think, a terrific indicator on, on both of them, access to health care and inequality within the household. But also on, on gender issues, I think they've got a really important role as supplementary indicators precisely because of what's missing from the, the household consumption aggregates. And that's an argument that doesn't say they have a kind of independent status. They have a status that it derives from the limitations of our measures. Other people fairness to, would argue. They also should have an independent status, and I recognize that argument. Uh, I don't necessarily agree, but, but I think what it, in pra for all practical purposes it comes to the same thing. <laughs> we need both. And I've just concentrated on, on income poverty measurement, and that's just the limitation of the talk. Um, on the um, validation, um, this is really important. I don't think we do enough of it, but we, we, we try to do, I and mean, good poverty measurement in a country work is essentially a lot to do with the validation of the kind of numbers I've got here. Um, I don't do that at the global level, but in the country level work, it's, it's, it's important. It's hugely important. It's ground truthing the numbers, and, and yeah, you've got to be very careful. I've done a lot of field work over the years, and field work often, I think, taught me that uh, something that was wrong. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I went to a household survey which was nationally representative and I just proved, convinced myself my field work was wrong too. So it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 there are roles for different kinds of information and I very much support a mixed method approach for all of this for the country level work. Um, I don't um, have any answer to doing that at the global level and I'm not sure how I'd ever do it. Uh, on the history question, um, I just really haven't got a clue. but. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, because we just don't, I mean, uh, our data, I, 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 some people, my, my, my dear friend, Francois Bourguignon, uh, wrote a paper with um, Christian Morrison and where, where he, took he, the, he, took, he took our data and he added lots of data and he went back to uh, 19th century. Um, but, you know, he did it really well and really carefully, but I, I just can't. That's heroic. That's much, much more heroic than I can be, I'm afraid. I'm starting in 1980, where I know I've got a decent set of surveys that pass my maybe maybe inadequate quality standards, but they pass a test. You know, they're nationally representative. I can see what was done. I know the sample weights were done right. I got a I got at least a clue that this is measuring something. Um, whereas when you start to go back in time, you start using other people's calculations. Um, Francois and Christian were, I think, were more more um, trusting than than I would be. But um, it gave a, a very interesting picture, and you can read their paper. It was published in the AER a few years ago. Um, 
a very nice paper which gives you a history back, back to the 19th century, as I recall, or uh, turn of the century. Going back further than that, forget it. You know, I mean, we could, we could. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what, to, what we do. Uh, Robert's question. Um, you know, uh, I'm both a fan and a critic of the ICP, uh, and the ICP is in, within my part of the bank, but not in my department. Um, the I think my feeling is the 2005 ICP was. I didn't know it at the time before, but I'd argue that 2005 ICP was the first ICP we should have believed. Before that, I'd say, Bleh. and I didn't even know it was a black box. You know, I was one of those users of the I of PPPs, like everybody else, and I'd never looked inside that black box. And in 2005, I, I started to, uh, 2008 using when the dead, dead numbers for 2005 came. I started looking into it, and so did other people. Uh, Angus Deaton started looking at it. We've all started to get inside the black box. We've learnt a number of things. One of them is that it was a huge improvement over what they used to do. You know, I, I kind of do micro stuff and I do price surveys sometimes. When I see what the ICP used to do for price surveys, it's a, I think it's appalling. Um, they didn't have quality standards, well defined. When you do a price survey, one of the clear things is you've got to define the commodity. You, know? you can't just say, what's the price of rice? If you ask what the price of rice is in London, and you compare it to the price of when you ask that same question in Bangladesh, you're going to get a completely and a comparable number because of the quality difference. You've got to nail the standards down. That can create problems. I mean, you end up with nailing the standards down too far, too much. It can be very hard to find the commodity. Um, that's, a, that's a real, there's a problem there. But I think unless you have strict quality standards, a price survey is, is going to be um, questionable. And that's exactly what we saw in the 2005 ICP results. For example, in China, the, the uh, purchasing power parity exchange rate relative to official exchange rate, it, it, it rose dramatically. Basically, because I think we've been under, we were using lower quality goods in China to price the, the bundle. We were using lower quality, implicitly lower quality goods than, say, here, right? Or making comparison with the U.S., the, the benchmark, the um, reference country. Um, so I'd say that things have improved, but I've also learnt. Um, one of the things we learnt is that, um, and I, I, you know, it took it was pulling teeth to get this information out of the ICP. Now ICP. Is in a part of this house in a part of the part of the bank, but it's a separate institution, so I can't criticise it in public. <laughs> uh, it was pulling teeth, really, to pulling teeth to to um, figure out what they'd done in China, and I was very worried about the PVP in China. We ended up publishing a paper in a volume edited by Joe Stiglitz and Sudhiran and, and um, Siegel. Um, that um, really trying to unpack that PPP and what they'd done in the calculations. And we found all kinds of sampling biases and so on. We ended up correcting for all of that, recalculating the PPP for China. Um, and that's what I've used here. It's definitely not the same as the official ICP number. We corrected it for a number of countries. We're doing that ourselves. It's not official. <coughs> it's not ICP. It's ours. And our corrections are trying basically to get better and better from the point of view of poverty measurement. There's a, a very nice work by Angus Deaton and Olivia Dupre where they also re-weighted the index because essentially PPPs are, you, when you, get, you shouldn't ask me about PPPs, Robert, I'll never stop. But you, you, they, where, where they had re-weighted the index to try to make it the PPP near the poverty line. You know, and they found, came up with this very clever way of doing it. Um, I've, uh, I've tested robustness to that. I have a long, long paper in the QJE last year which includes robustness tests, the differences in how you construct the PPP, uh, including using the, uh, the method of uh, De uh, Deaton and uh, Dupre. And you can see the sensitivity tests there. It turned out not to be very sensitive to those changes, the changes in reweighting the PPP. Other things it is more sensitive. A big thing is that how you deal with discrepancies between national accounts and surveys. Um, and there I think we've got a, you've still got continuing worries, particularly in India inconsistencies between the national accounts and the surveys, um, which we still have not figured out. S the truth is really somewhere between the two, and <coughs> we're just not sure. So India's a real problem there. Other problems we could talk about forever, but I think let's go to another round of questions. Are you yeah. confident about your poverty numbers, given all the uncertainty that you've talked about? I'm as confident as I could possibly be, given what I know. But how can you ever be... Uh, you know, uh, if you're a serious data person, you can never say, oh, this is the truth. I'm saying as best I know, as best we can do, this is what we think the answer is. Yeah. 
Okay, let's get a couple more questions quickly. Okay, we're gonna go to the uh, blue stripes, then to the peach colored shirt there, and then to the blue shirt in the back. Keep your questions relatively short, and we might have time to answer these. Uh, yeah, Stefan Windberger, MSC, International Political Economy at the LSE. Uh, you did mention access to credit. Poor people at some point, I had uh, the privilege to work with Mohammed Yunus for six months in Bangladesh on microfinance and social business. Uh, so I was wondering, given that you mentioned that, but you didn't go into the detail, um, what's your stance on the impact of microfinance on poverty alleviation? Because like a lot of the earlier studies from the World Bank, like 2001, they gave a very strong implication of that, on that, but like new studies from David Rudman from last year, they said that like, uh, there is not really a, a large, large impact. So what's your stance on this? And especially, what is the World Bank? Do I know that the IDA has a microfinance and private sector development office, but I haven't seen any publications in the last three years. So uh, apart from the homepage, what are they currently working on? And the second thing, um, you also cited um, Banerjee and Duflo. And I was wondering uh, on the like, randomized control evaluations that they uh, so brilliantly described in poor economics, is there any notion of like the World Bank um, trying to promote these randomized control evalu evaluations as a conditional measure when giving out loans, for example, so that the country has to do, uh, has to find out like the most effective measure in uh, doing whatever they want to do? Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, my, co well, my name is Beth Krieger. I'm from SOAS. Um, and my question is surrounding policy, how it can be changed, and also what sorts of things affect it. I, uh, I was wondering, don't we need to have a sort of dialogue between other social sciences and economists to, to, to get away from this huge focus on numbers, figures, and, and graphs? And couldn't there, be, couldn't there be research done with an economist and a sociologist or an anthropologist? Mm -hmm. Couldn't there be a joint effort in, in that? Because really, we're talking about non-economic issues. Mm -hmm. So we need to have non-economic opinions also. And it should, and it should be at a global level also, mm -hmm. instead, of just, instead of just being sort of on the side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Keep thinking about that. We have one more. <laughs> OK. Um, Martin Haig, I work in the scenarios team at Shell. You spent a, there's a follow-on question, really, to the fellow speaking about um, access to credit, really. Because you spoke uh, l extensively about the huge work to try and get a grip of the numbers of what's actually going on and what we should be targeting. I wondered if you have more to say about the factors behind, the causes behind the, uh, uh, sort of ch the trends over the last few mm -hmm. years. Possibly, you know, in particular with a view to give us a clue as to the way this might go into the future and, you know, to help policy. Okay. Stop there. It's All right. Five minutes. Um, microfinance. Well, well you know, it's, hard to, it's hard to give you an answer, really. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say, oh, I think microfinance is great for poverty reduction. I'd never, I wouldn't say that about anything, really. Because um, well, all the time we've learnt, and in one place it works well, in other place it works, and in some places everything you do, anything you do will work. In other places, nothing will work. You know, it's just like this, this contextual, we really learned how important context is, and we've gone deeper and deeper in understanding that. On the specifics, so for example, on Grameen Bank, you may know this is controversy over the evidence there, and uh, I've looked at that pretty closely, and I've come, I'm pretty confident that what we, the received wisdom on the impact of Grameen Bank, um, is 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 right. It's it has been it has been poverty reducing, it has had impact. This is from the work of, uh, I mean, this is the the controversies over the the work of uh, Mark, Mark Pitt and Shahid Kanka, a paper published in the JPE in 1998. And there's been a, a huge controversy over their identification strategy. Um, I, I've looked at that, and I'm not saying I'm an expert on it, but I've looked at it pretty closely. And I'm now, when I've seen the, the, the most recent work by Pitt and, and Kantka, uh, I think, they're, I think they're, they're OK. In other words, I think their, their identification strategy was sound within non-experimental identification strategies. Uh, which gets to your second point on RCTs. Um, you know, the, the World Bank was doing RCTs well before JPAL, and we've been doing RCTs for ages. We just don't think they're as quite as important as JPAL thinks. That's the bottom line here. I mean, and the reason we don't think they're quite that important is that we know that there are many things we do in development which for which RCTs are not applicable. Your RCTs, you need two things. You need it to be an assigned intervention, meaning that there are people who get it 
then there are people who don't get it, and there can be no spillover effects between them. And you've got to, and randomization has got to be possible in determining which is which. Many things we do, you know, rural road development, arterial roads, uh, building infrastructure, a lot of problems where, where it's, it's hard to believe trade reform, you know, tons of things that we do that are hugely important for development that, that you can't use this methodology for. No, fine, you can say, okay, great, we just don't use that methodology. But the problem is that across the world, students like you and the assistant professors are all running around looking for something to randomize. It's a game. And it's, it's just taken over. And it's so frustrating. I mean, I interview students now, in the freshly admitted PhDs, and they've never even done price theory. And they come from the University of Chicago. It's just like, what happened? You know, what they can do is RCTs. <laughs> now, this is just, so there's a real worry. And I think there's now a worry that even the, in the bank, which I think had a more balanced approach to this, I see a huge impact. So this will take a long time to work itself through. We're going to have to realize that we're, we're, the balance of our knowledge has been shifted by the, by the methodology. People have started with a, a method and then find a question to uh, apply the method to. That's always a bad idea. Start with a question, be eclectic on the methods. And the problem is that it's going to skew our knowledge towards those things for which randomization is feasible. And that's only a subset of the things. So our knowledge about development is now getting skewed heavily. I think it's also skewed by publication biases. There's a real problem here that it's just hard to get um, no impact results published. Believe me, I have years and years where everything, nothing had any impact. <laughs> and, and it's agony. <laughs> and so that, that creates another bias that when you don't have impact, you work harder and harder to find impact. And, you know, it's, there's a real worry there. Our knowledge can easily get skewed there. Um, on the... F um, um, my, my uh, um, joint efforts between economists and non-economists... Um, yeah, great. I mean, I think it's a matter of, um, I don't think it's, I don't see it quite that way. I mean, I'm an, an economist who reads a lot of non-economics, and I, 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 I think it's a matter about doing economics well or doing it badly. <laughs> you know, that's what the way Marty once put it. I'm, I'm quoting him. Um, you know, and I think a lot of the, you know, read, read good economists, like Robert Frank, the book I talked about on, on um, inequality in America. Um, you know, this is about, and he's struggling in the first chapter of that book, tr struggling with the question of why economists have not taken social effects seriously. Why do we stick so much to this model of utility as a function of own consumption I talked about? And it really is a, a, a bias. I mean, and so that's not doing economics well. He has a nice, there's a nice discussion there. And he's saying we learn, should learn from non-economists to do economics well doesn't mean that, you know, we don't also let non-economists do their thing as well. But, you know, I think a little bit of this polarization is partly the fault of economists partly doing economics badly and not being willing to, um, willing to broaden out a bit. Um, future. I just wrote future. What was that question about? Oh, 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 yeah. That, okay, so how much time have we got? About 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, one thing I will say, there's a, a new paper I have, or the second, the last, but the, not the last paper, but the last before on the, on the World Bank's we website called Benchmarking Poverty Reduction. Um, this is the third talk they've given today, but the, the other two were about that paper, which is not forecasting as such, but trying to set targets that are informed by past experience for poverty reduction going forward in the context of the discussions about post-2015, the new Millennium Development Goals. And, uh, and uh, that, that, I think, is an, goes some way to answering the question about where things are going going forward and where they might go under different policy scenarios. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>